Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 294. Today, we're joined by Aspen Golan and Kelly Harris, two chair makers that, in my mind, are at the forefront of cutting edge chair design, while also keeping an eye on historical scholarship, designs, and inspiration. And in this episode, you'll see why, without hesitation, I call them chair geeks. Before we get started, I want to let everyone know that the summer cohort of Mike Pekovich's Foundations of Woodworking e-learning class is live now. A lot of people have mentioned that we only do it in the winter time. Well, we're running it in the summer. So head on over to findwoodworking.com slash e-learning right now, get information, sign up, join in on the fun. It will make your woodworking better. All right, we'll get started with the show after a brief word from one of our sponsors. Since 1928, Woodcraft has been outfitting woodworkers and their shops with everything woodworkers want. Whether it's the world's best tools you're looking for, or that special species of wood for your next project, Woodcraft has been helping you make wood work for more than 90 years. Visit woodcraft.com or shop one of their 75 stores nationwide to create something cool. We're going to do something a little bit different. Aspen, you're going to introduce Kelly. Kelly, you're going to introduce Aspen. Oh, God. I don't deserve it. It's an honor I haven't earned. (laughs) Aspen, tell me about Kelly. And like, what is, what is, what does Kelly do? Right. Again, I don't deserve this honor and I'm unprepared. (laughs) Um, All right. Kelly um, is someone who I am privileged to call a dear friend um, who is a furniture maker and tool maker, designer, educator, um, based in Brooklyn, um, learned parts of her trade at the North Bennett Street School prior to that and continuing on to today is an amazing musician, um, cocktail artist, and dog owner <laughs> dog <laughs> i don't even owner just in in a really healthy beautiful relationship with a lucky canine i would say um <laughs> very cool and guy. kelly has also been working um with me and supporting me in many ways through um the work i've been doing with chair makers toolbox and also we did a fellowship together at winter tour museum where we just nerded out for a solid month uninterrupted on chairs so kelly that- harris everyone Yes. This, so <laughs> the, the fellowship is where we're going to start. Just, just so mm. you don't know. Um, cool. Kelly, introduce Aspen. Yeah. To, Aspen to Golan is a dear friend of mine and someone who I have been lucky enough to get to know over the course of time from her studies at North Bennett Street School through all of her wonderful community organizing um, with Chairmaker's Toolbox, um, someone who I've gotten to work alongside. Aspen is one of the most talented woodworkers that I know um, in just basic function of building things as well as design and teaching those things. And pretty much everything that Aspen touches is gold. <laughs> and... <laughs> It's just really freaking awesome to get to like watch all of that happen and also hang out and talk about nerdy things like what we're about to get into with her. Yeah. Okay. okay, so so and just covering the both of you, I can't think of two nerdier woodworkers. <laughs> like 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 y'all really get down into the nitty gritty of woodworking geekery on a whole mess of levels um kelly Girl, you got to do it right man <laughs> yeah it's what kelly, we're here for i don't think i've ever seen anyone a prouder and be really <laughs> geeking out on mm-hmm. you've recently started selling a tenon cutter for, like yeah. for a windsor tapered tenon cutter right yeah and i was at um, Pete's Peak Albert shop while you were, was it like maybe one of the closest, it wasn't a full production one. No, but it was right before it was moments before. 
And the thought that goes into one of your tools was staggering <laughs> where like the wedge, you put this in there and I'll get and the blade will be back in the perfect spot, right where you put it, even after sharpening, blah, blah, blah. And just, it was, and it wasn't complicated. Right. So, yeah. so, so like truly beautiful tool engineering is thoroughly thought through and thought out, but not complicated, I think. And, cool. um, you were just beaming over this, <laughs> this, this prototype and, and like, just, just going over like the finer details of the chamfers on the, on the handle and, and everything. So, yeah. um, I was, I, I felt honored to witness it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, yeah, running into you in the hallway as I was running back and forth between Aspen shop and Pete shop, as I was like tweaking, I think I was like tweaking the design on things, but running into you and your reaction to it was the first public reaction that I got. And it fed me enormously. So thank you for that. Like well, your excitement over it. I was like, Oh, that's cool. This is like exciting to the outside world looking in. Yeah. Total. Well, I'm, I'm a geek too. So. Yeah. So <laughs> we found each other. And yes. <laughs> I think we way should have been about the, yeah. Well, you were holed up in your, uh, in your broken, broken leg. Oh yeah. yeah and then that, that was, happens sometimes. That was right in the thick of it. Yeah. <laughs> and then you sometimes you break your leg and you adjust, you know? Yeah. But yeah. Um, all right. So I have a truck driving by. Okay. I have a mess of chair making questions mm. and I thought, you two were the perfect dynamic duo to answer some geeky chair making questions because both of you make a lot of chairs. You're very, very passionate about it. And more importantly, you've studied a lot of chairs. Mm -hmm. So this first for question, better or worse. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Whew. laughs> That's another, that's another. Yeah, podcast. we're ready. We're ready though. Yeah. <laughs> I always like to say that with my best woodworking friends, we don't actually talk about woodworking that much, you know, because woodworking is the thing that brought us together, but it's not the reason why we're hanging out at any given moment. But to be honest, if I actually dissect conversations I have with Kelly, I would say that maybe 30% of them are like, Hey, did you notice? <laughs> Yeah, it's like this incredibly minute thing that then we will like hash out together. And it's just, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So this is going to be great. I'm excited. Cool. Yay. Um, all right. So this, this question is from Rex, who we all know and love Rex, right? Oh, Rex. Rex Hansen. Yeah. So Rex's question, over the next two years, I will be visiting New England museums to look at period furniture pieces. I'd like to prepare a tool bag with tools and a checklist mm. to help me efficiently observe obtain and document select furniture features characteristics and dimensions to prepare reproduction drawing for my own use george walker brilliantly discussed his process and tools taken to obtain permission observe measure document prepare reproduction drawings for an ohio tall case clock in copying museum pieces if i remember 186 um technology such as the common use of cell phones having cameras and flashlights as well as circumstances and museum practices change with time. Uh, will you discuss the tools taken, best practices, procedures for inspecting, measuring, and documenting a piece of furniture while at a museum? And I thought you two were the only ones that I wanted to ask this. Well, because there's, so for the listener, oh. just, uh, in the next few weeks, there will be a video workshop on the website posting of uh, a friend of, of y'all's, uh, Dan Fea's, measuring a piece of Phil Lowe's and mm -hmm. documenting it and going through this whole process. So I, a part of me said like, Oh, this is covered. We don't need to answer this. And then I talked to you two in the hallway <laughs> geeking out and you're using lasers and stuff. 
Oh yeah. Or, or light oh on. yeah, we're all about it. We got yeah. lasers. <laughs> we got iPads. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. We got, we got shop apps. made tools. Yeah. Oh, we got yeah. apps. I mean it's right. It's almost like like I forget. We spent maybe two weeks putting together and producing a kit of chair measuring tools before we went to winter tour. And yeah. obviously all of this, Kelly and I were actually talking about this a little while ago. Um, like a lot of our techniques and a lot of the techniques that Dan's going to show, like they all depend on how much access you have to the object. Right. And even us, we were, we were granted fellowship at that museum and we still had, we went through a little interview process with our tools to try to convince them that we <laughs> were not going to damage anything while using them. But I think, I think that we have some good advice, regardless of whether or not you're able to touch the object, move the object. So yeah, I think we can hit this one. Kelly, what do you think? Yeah. First off, tell us about the fellowship. What all was, what does that mean? What did you do? Mm -hmm. What happened? So we applied for a fellowship at Winter Tour Museum in December of 2020. And um, we proposed that we wanted to go and study specifically their Windsor chairs because they have such a such a huge collection of Windsor chairs. Um, we wanted to go and study them, look at how they were made, get specific about dimensions, look at design, and then also think about how relevant is that history in our making today and what do we want to see going forward with Windsor chair making um, for ourselves and, you know, our community. And we wanted to incorporate that into teaching classes and just sort of like broadening our horizons and allowing space for creativity and fun and we were granted that fellowship because yeah we were they liked (laughs) that idea yeah because we were lucky and they liked our idea totally i think that like one of the things that we talked about a lot while we were taking our measurements just to like also bring it back to that question was you know there are people who are gonna who will always tell you how to do something or what the rules are, right? Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm concerned, if I'm trying to figure out what the rules are of Windsor chair making, like how small can something get? How many spindles do you really need? What like species of wood actually work? Like who's the better teacher than a bunch of chairs that are 300 years old and still standing, right? Like they know what the rules are. And so we were like, okay, cool. So if we measure these chairs and we figure out like, what are the true dimensions that you can go to? Like, what are the real like rules of the geometry? And so how can we then use that information to not take for granted all of this stuff that we've been told about these objects? And then like, what kind of design freedom will that give us if we actually know? I mean, as much as anyone can ever know, and I'm sure we'll be knowing more and more for the rest of our lives. But the idea, yeah, like Kelly so eloquently said, is like, how do you come up with these sort of like factors of furniture making, like what are the rules that you can then use to base designs off of? And then how can we communicate that information to our students so that they have more freedom when they're designing mm-hmm. their chairs? Yeah. Interesting. So, Ba-doom. so you're, you're trying to find the extremes as well. I'm sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally. <clears throat> both extremes and, and I, averages. Yeah. Okay. We found yeah. a lot of both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, Aspen and I met at North Bennett Street School. Like we are both people who are very interested in foundations and like foundational information. And so, and we're also really excited about the present and the future. So we were like incorporating all of those <laughs> in yeah. this fellowship. Yeah. Um, so that was, the, so that I think that, did we answer your question about what the winter tour Yeah. All right. Well, no, I I have a follow up question. Um, So the study, did you write a paper afterwards? What what is Mm. what? Well, it was a two part thing. Like the goal was it was supposed to be two months and we would spend the first month at the museum, like on site. And that we executed. We spent every day in this weird old house sitting with a chair and measuring it and producing more and more hyper-specific spreadsheets to contain the information. So that's what we did. Um, 
and so that we'd be able to access it later. So we have all these photographs of these objects that are either like extremely unusual or extremely average, like whatever we thought was going to help us really build out that set of information. Um, and then we were supposed to spend the second month at uh, my studio here in Rollinsford building chairs that were contemporary, but based on the information that we gleaned from the collection. Mm -hmm. Then I did this awesome thing where I fell down in Pete's <laughs> yard and broke my leg. So I think that, that second part <laughs> got delayed. Yeah. But both of us are already, we designed chairs when we were there that we mm -hmm. wanted to build. Kelly is currently executing a commission that she's using a lot of those measurements from, and she should say everything she wants about that. And then we have some ideas that we came up with collaboratively that I'm still very much hoping to carve out time to build. And I too have a commission that's like super design based. So I'm planning on digging into those spreadsheets, using that information to inform those objects. So yeah, that yeah. was the second part. Yeah. And so, yeah, I know we're both so excited. Though. So we did, I, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, yeah. um, so <laughs> we did, we did do some writing about it. And so be, like Aspen was saying, it's two parts. So we did our writing about our first part, which we submitted to the museum. And the second part, we gave them an outline and some like rough ideas of a, a timeline of what we're doing which is what Aspen just described. Um, so there will be more writing about that once we're in completion of that. Yeah, I would yeah. say that the other aspect, um, which Kelly touched on initially, is the educational aspect. So how do we use yeah. that information to inform a class? And I just got back from teaching, and I can't believe I'm even standing up straight after doing it, but two weeks at Anderson Ranch teaching a design and build class to like anyone from professional furniture maker to like never touch wood before. And so I very much use the information that we got from there in order to create these sort of rules of Windsor chair making. I'm like, you're going to design within this. Like if your stretcher gets, or if your legs get this long, you need a stretcher. If your stretcher is this big, it needs to enter into a leg at this size. Like if you have spindles this long, you need X number of them. If they're going to be this size or this dimension, do, 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 do. so creating these flow charts that help people understand the material, regardless of whether or not they have, you know, five, 10, 15 years of experience in the medium so that they're able to design and play and make new pieces right away. So I, I that was really exciting and getting yeah. to Kelly and I haven't even had a chance to talk about that yet. I know. But um, I used our, I brought our binder. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I've been referencing, yeah. we have a, Aspen and I have a, a shared Google Drive, which I think we might have just named. Like, what is it named? Uh, what was it like you and I work or something like that? Yeah. Me and you work. Anyway, that has all of the dimensions, all of the measurements of every chair that we measured. Um, How as many well chairs? As photographs. How many chairs? Sorry? How many chairs? Is it like 15 that 15, we gained? I want to say okay. 15 to 18. Yeah, um, it was hard to so, pick. And they weren't all chairs, too. They weren't all chairs. Yeah. Um, the binder also includes everything from that um, shared file, as well as some patterns that we took off of, oh, yeah. like physical patterns that we took. So those mm -hmm. are fun binders. Yeah, we did a cradle at one point. That we was did a cradle. weird one. We yeah. found like a Windsor, a cradle, because essentially, like, I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make when they talk about Windsor chairs is they conflate the process with the style that they most typically see that process applied to you know so they'll look at the chair and say like oh well, windsor chairs looks like this right but no it's actually just a system of joinery and so we were you know we find a cradle that's essentially put together in exactly the same way that a windsor chair is put together and so we measure that too right um and so understanding the material and the process and its flexibility i think was part a really probably I don't know, maybe one of the most critical parts of that fellowship yeah. and of our practices and our interest in chairs generally. So mm -hmm. for a chair dummy like me <clears throat> to find like, like I think of a, a Windsor joint or a Windsor style construction as generally a solid seat tapered mortise and tenons. And from there, the sky's the limit. Yeah. Um, are letterbacks I mean, in your in your? You're not a chair dummy. 
(laughs) (laughs) I hang out with some cool people. I'll say that. But, you know, um, I guess like Kelly and I also we gave a talk at Sotheby's um, for their Americana Symposium. And we had to answer this exact question. We realized we're like, wait a minute, maybe people don't know this stuff. And we put together some slides trying to really break it down into its essential components. And you got some, right, like the tapered joinery, the seat as the sort of backbone of the chair as opposed to having it be like these long posts in the back. Um, but like moisture differentials are critical too, you know, so all tenons are super dried, mortises are stay as wet as they can. And that's part of how you get joinery that's tighter than, you know, any human being can make it, right? You need to use moisture either the presence or the lack of it. Um, And then of course using greenwood too is not necessary, but either greenwood or simulated greenwood through soaking and splitting is a really amazing way of like, you know, getting the kinds of extreme bends that one associates with Windsor furniture. Mm -hmm. Um, Anything else, Kelly, that pops up? No, I think that that's really it. The main things are the working with moisture differentials that the seat you know, the undercarriage, meaning like the the legs go up into the seat and the top of the chair goes down into the seat. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and the taper joinery. Maybe also that like, it's one of the rare furniture forms where making it with hand tools is actually the most efficient way to do it. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people like laboring with hand tools because it's romantic or because it's enjoyable or because they think they should. And the cool thing about yeah. Windsor chairs is like, genuinely, it's not faster with a jointer and a planer and, you know, $35,000 worth of pluggable equipment. Um, so I think that's another sort of process aspect that's really critical. Yeah. Hmm. So would a ladder back be a Windsor? Because there's so many elements. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, no. they're like, I consider them like... Um, like cousins are like really good friends because okay. they're they have so much in in common. Like okay. the material is very similar, and the way that you work with moisture differential is the very tools. Similar. The tools are that, similar. I've never said this to Kelly before, but sometimes I think of us as like a Windsor and a ladder back because yeah. Kelly does kind of specialize in ladder backs, and I kind of specialize in Windsors between us. You know, in terms of what we spend most of our time doing. Like I am a little lost in the ladder back process, not in the creation of the parts, but when we get into the drilling and like just the, you know, because I don't do it as much, you know, and like with the seat weaving, it's just, it's a whole other, whole other mm-hmm. thing then. And Kelly's building a bunch right now. I built a yeah. few, you know, but there are definitely moments where I'm holding the parts being like, what is happening? <laughs> Why am I all wet? But yeah, we're <laughs> like Me too, a- Aspen. A Windsor and a ladder back. Yeah. Sometimes I'm just holding parts and I'm like, who am I and where? What is happening? <laughs> yeah. How did I get here? How okay. did I even get here? Sometimes I'll just be like, wait, it smells like a chair maker shop. Okay. <laughs> here I am. <laughs> and the olfactory, you know, comes in and helps me. So what are the tools Rex is going to put in his little bag? Right. To get back to okay. you. Sorry, yeah. Rex. We really went on a tangent there (laughs) yeah we actually made a really fun little series of videos of how to use these objects too so we should probably just post that on the internet kelly and i are both kind of um lazy instagram users but we can do it we can do it yeah yeah um i guess like i use a a tilt box a lot you know like the little box that you use to um figure out what, you know, angle your table saw blade is at. That's super useful. Okay. Right, Kelly? We use that a ton. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to also focus those. on the things that maybe Dan didn't maybe use as much, um, but like tilt box yeah. lasers. We used a lot of floss, post-it notes. What? Floss? Um, what? What yeah, using? floss Flo- is very important. I, I can't, I'm like, <laughs> normally like, somebody says something, go, oh yeah, that ma- no, that makes no sense. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you want to get like, Okay, so what Rex's question, the part that he asked that both Kelly and I, I think, sort of raised our eyebrows at was the part where he was like, I want to actually reproduce these. And so that's the floss and the post-it notes are very important for reproducing. <laughs> but basically, I'll, Kelly, you can cover, which one do you want to talk about? I'll talk about the other one. I'll talk about floss. Yeah. 
<laughs> so okay, and then somebody also, tell me wanna, why. <laughs> I also want to preface this by saying that we're right now talking about if you have access, like yes. to getting close and to the to the piece that you're studying. I have some things to say about if you don't, but I'm going to talk about floss for now. So what you can do with floss is attach it to um, really any straight. Um, but if you have a compass that has angles on it, you can attach a the protractor. floss to it. A protractor, thank you. You can attach the floss to the center. And when you move it out, it tells you what the angle is. Uh -huh. And so if you put the flat on the seat and then bring the floss out to where the leg is coming out, you can actually get the angle at which the leg is coming out of the seat. Okay. So it's like the added beam, like a really long yeah. beam for a protractor. Yeah. It's like a pointer. Okay. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, this is like kind of gets into a whole other conversation of where are you looking at a chair from to get the rake and the splay. And um, I, I'm going to say, let's not get into that. And okay. right now, and we'll <laughs> stay focused on the tool. But that's why floss is cool, because you can get the angle of a thing. And even if you're not up close touching the piece, you can get an angle. You can get an angle of like the spindles. Mm -hmm. You could do it from a distance in a museum, even if maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. maybe, yeah, more or less. Yeah. And you can sneak that enough. stuff into a museum and do it. If yeah. one's looking, huh? Yeah. Like from a distance. Yeah. And I guess the lasers do the exact same thing, really. Okay. Like it's just so essentially when Kelly and I were using lasers at winter tour, and I think you, this is a fun one for people who are visiting museums because you don't have to touch anything. But you are you do have to get permission to shoot lasers in a room where presumably other people are enjoying the furniture without lasers. Right. Um, so, <laughs> but basically, like we would just use um, we'd use lasers, we'd split up the object either into sight lines and resultant angles or into rake and splay and set two lasers. And you basically put the little guy on a tripod and you just angle it until it lines up perfectly and bisects the top and the bottom of the object or the component that you're trying to record. And then you can take that protractor, slide it in front of the laser and the laser is pointing to the angle that you want. Oh. Laser, so that's a way to do it. From laser a or floss. Laser or floss, you know, it's dealer's choice. Um, I would have never thought that, there was a scenario in which they were interchangeable, <laughs> but <laughs> I think that what's, What's dope about the laser, Kelly, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like most Windsor chair angles, you need two angles in order to capture that that location yeah. in space. Yeah. So you need either rake and splay, and that's when you sort of look at the chair as though it's existing in this like X, Y axis. So you look at it exclusively from the front and then exclusively from the side. And so from the side is splay, sorry, from the front is, <laughs> is um, splay and the side is rake. And so the cool thing about the lasers is that you can set one to splay and then the other, you can set it exactly 90 degrees and you can actually measure on the floor that you're setting them at exactly 90 degrees apart. So it's a more accurate measurement in that way. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're holding up the protractor and the floss, you don't necessarily have a way to capture the exact location in space that you put, took that first measurement from so that you can take the other one at exactly 90 degrees from it, if gotcha. that makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. Just tell us if we get too nerdy. On no, this, this is stuff. this is <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> prime nerd zone. Yeah. Um, okay, so you were explaining to me, Kelly. I think you were telling me about your use of an iPad. And oh yeah, yeah. So backing up Rex for you here is <laughs> what I would do if I didn't have. <laughs> access the way that we had at winter tour um i i take an enormous amount of photos if i see something that i like i take photos that i don't even think that i want or need in the moment because when you're getting into reproduction you will get to a point in time where you're like wait how did the top edge meet the side edge at that one spot and if you take more photos than you could ever possibly imagine wanting or needing, you might hopefully find 
that detail. And so like details as well as like zooming out as many angles as you can. And then the iPad, that comes in like, there's a couple of things. One, you can use an app on the iPad called Procreate. Um, Awful name, great app. You can take a photo and then you can draw into that program. And so you can simply take photos and then take notes. So if you take a photo of a chair and then you do your floss or laser, you can take notes directly on that photograph of what you're talking about so that in the future you're like, oh, that's what I was talking about. Gotcha. Um, What Aspen and I ended up using it for a lot um, and Pete uses it for, uh, I think the first time that I saw it being used was, was Pete using it, is that you can use it in design. And so it has layers. You can draw directly on the program. You could take a photo of a chair that you like um, and then draw over it and then like just delete your original photo that you took and like you've now created your own design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I know that that's not, yeah. I, oh. We made these really fun sandwich drawings on Procreate where we would take one, we'd choose a chair that had a really good sort of overall shape or angle or blah, 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 something about it that we wanted to keep. And then we would photograph it and we would take all of the measurements, all of the angles, all of the critical junctures, and we'd record all of that. And then we would start designing on top of it. And the idea would be change all the shapes but don't change the essential geometry. And so essentially you go into it, like basically using that original design as like a paper doll that you're sort of draping new images, new shapes, new whatever on top of it. And you come out of it with this photograph of the original chair, all of the angles and all the important information written right on there. And then a design of your own on top of it that looks nothing like the original. Yeah. Very cool. And you can also buy an old iPad. This isn't like you don't have to go out and get a new one. You can find one, use, and um, get Procreate on it. So, Mm -hmm. and that's like, I think it's a one-time cost of $50. I think it's only $10. I I was was going to say $20. I got my iPad. You know, there's plenty of people who are upgrading their iPads on Craigslist. Just jump on there and get somebody's iPad that they use to like read the news and check Facebook. Mm -hmm. Get that for like 40 bucks. Get a, you know, Apple Pencil. I think the other thing, I don't know why we're talking about Procreate so much, but like the other thing I love about Procreate is like... (laughs) We need, if you're looking for uh, someone to pay to talk about this, Procreate. (laughs) It's probably me. But I think the other (laughs) thing I love about it um, is I love design processes where there's like no um there's no cost to changing your mind right because like when i do like a full orthographic drawing on paper like we were you know forced to do taught to do however you want to phrase it at Senate <laughs> street school you like if you want to change something by a half inch just to see what it looks like the cost of that is enormous like you're going to be redrawing erasing whatever you're tracing it for like an hour and then you might realize your paper oh, is only... tattered and torn yeah. you realize you only wanted to change it a quarter of an inch or it wasn't even a good idea to begin with and the cool thing about procreate is not only is it easy to like erase and change your mind but also if i as i'm drawing come across a design i like i don't even bother to stop and screenshot it i just keep going i erase it and keep going because it has this replay button mm-hmm. and so you can then watch a video of your own process and pause it wherever you want so mm-hmm. I'll just keep going. Like, there's no need to, oh, that one's nice. I'll put it aside, get another piece of paper, start again. It's like, no, just cruise. Yeah. And so yeah. it's like finding a design process that moves as fast as your brain can when it's really cooking is one of the most exciting things that I think you can find in furniture design, especially since it's such a slow and arduous process so much of the time. Yeah. Um, it's really wonderful when you can find something that you can just move through quickly without any penalty for changing your mind or trying something stupid. And, you know, half the time it is stupid. And half the time you're like, oh, there's like a little bit of a gem in that idea. And I'm glad that I was able to articulate it and get it onto the paper so that I have some record of it and I can return. Yeah. Yeah. So were you, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like 
you were dabbling with 3D scanning. Oh, at yeah. At some point with the iPad <laughs> as well, right? Only a little bit. We, I had a, Kelly, remember my friend Julia, who's a resident at um, Penland School of Craft, sent us this really cool app. Um, I believe it's called, it's like URBA, but I'll look it up. Okay. But basically, oh, yeah. you can take photos all around an object yes. from all angles, and then it will like compile them and turn it into like a rotatable rendering. Oh, yeah. I can see that being useful in a in a museum situation. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I would yeah. say just like the fall, the, um, to follow up on that also was, uh, Aspen that, that like measurement card that you can use that we learned from Lance. Oh yeah. That thing's right? the best. If you can't touch things at a museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you, I teach that in every class that I teach whether it's chairs, it doesn't matter because everyone needs to know about it. And so few people do. And it's, it's, um, well, it's a us. scaling chart. Okay. I actually, wait, I have one. Do you want to see it? I don't yeah. know. This All is right. Everybody, everybody okay. on, on I'm going to go grab move it. over to, to, to YouTube. <laughs> you're going to love it. You're going <laughs> to okay. love it. <laughs> now, while, while you're getting that Aspen, Kelly, you had, you had mentioned post-it notes, not, not a, uh, a everyday woodworking tool. Yeah. Right. So if you can touch the furniture, then what you can do is tear the post-it notes up into little pieces and sticker them around, say, like where the where a spindle meets a spindle deck or where an arm meets. And you can get the exact shape and measurement by placing the sticker notes around that the joining piece. That like that sticky note move, and I think this scaling rule are two of the most important things if we're talking about not just getting a general impression of the piece, but actually trying to reproduce it exactly. So like I right. did um, I did that talk, the woodworking in the whatever century at Williamsburg. And so I had to go to Colonial Williamsburg and like measure a piece for exact reproduction. And so come, like basically, I learned this from Steve Brown. He taught me how to cut out of a piece of like foam core. Basically, if this is the component, you cut a piece of foam core so that there's like quite a bit of space around it. You slide that piece of foam core over the object. You clamp it using, and you'll like this, the Stumac um, like guitar clamps, the really gentle ones, the wooden ones, oh, so the, that you don't the damage the object. Yeah, yeah, the cam ones. Yeah. Yeah. So you clamp it that way. And then you have this like piece of foam cord that's hovering around this object that has like, you know, a specific section that you want to measure. And then as Kelly said, you just tear the little pieces of post-it note, put the sticky edge on the foam core. And then you see that as the more you put on, the more faithfully you're able to record that shape. And then you can slide it off without doing anything more than brushing the piece of antique furniture mm -hmm. with post-it notes, which most people are cool with. Hmm. Yeah, and now you now context. have a pattern, right? You yeah. now have a pattern yeah. that you can work off of in recreation. That's awesome. Heck yeah. Yeah. All right. What's the scaling card? Yeah. It's been okay. This is in the dorky zine that I made for um, how to make Windsor chairs. <laughs> And I give this to everybody who takes my class, but I had to include it. This is the scaling rule. Okay. And what essentially you... what it does is it starts at zero and it spans out so that there, we're at five, 10, 15, 20, all the way up to 50. And what you can do is you can blow this up. So I would take this thing to Kinko's and I would expand it, right? So that it's, you know, maybe 11 by 17. I think that's the size that we had in the North Bennett bench room. And what you do, let's go to the front of this is you take a photo of a chair, ideally not a three quarter view like this. Instead, you want something directly from the side and directly from the front. And what you're gonna do is you choose an object that has some sort of known dimension. So usually the thickness of the seat in Windsor chairs is like one and three quarter inches. That's a pretty standard dimension. If you don't have any actually known dimensions, then what you would do is you take a little piece of paper and you put it on your actual photograph and you draw a little, two little lines that are the distance apart that this seat is. Mm -hmm. Then you take it to your scaling chart. This is worth it, I swear. You take it to your scaling <laughs> chart and you slide it over so that 
those two marks, the top and the bottom of the seat, line mm-hmm. up with one and two over here. And then what you can do is you can use that little edge of the paper and keep scribing all of these little lines onto it. And what you do is you make a custom ruler that exists within the reality of that photograph. So then you can use that little ruler to measure any other component of that chair. From that a is officially record. the dorkiest thing I've ever heard in Woodward. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, making- it works great. You're making a custom ruler. So, all right, all right. To sum it up, for those who are who are listening <laughs> and not watching, thank you. There, there, there was a, there was a bunch of angles, and then you match up a known measurement to a place on this chart, and then from there you are making a custom ruler that fits this one particular photograph. Yeah. So essentially, it's a ratio. So if we say that within this photograph like from this tiny little spot to this tiny little spot is two inches. Let's just say we know that. Then we can expand from that and say that, okay, so if from here to here is two inches, then from here to there is eight inches. And that's what that scale allows you to establish. So then you can use that little piece of paper to measure all the other parts of that chair within that photograph. So you could, if you are nerdy (laughs) enough to know the like general components of the chair, you can reference it based on your understanding of that material. You could also, Rex Hansen, put a golf pencil in there. You can oh, put in a like a, a, a penny because yeah. you know how big that object is. And so you can say, okay, well, if a penny is this big, then I know that everything else in this photograph is this big. Is, is 22 pennies long. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's right. And, but it works really quickly. Like that makes it sound like you have to do math. And I just want the world to know that I hate math. I'm bad at it and I don't do it. And so every, all of the angles that I use and all of these tools that I use, they're very much all like, they may um, be uncomfortably math adjacent, but they don't require any math thinking. I promise. Larissa Huff is going to argue with you about that one day. She's ah, like, I know. Well, actually, <laughs> I mean, math Larissa- is in everything, but <laughs> Larissa you don't have Huff to talk just- about it. She like just attended this talk that I gave at the Furniture Society like annual conference about using lasers and angles to figure out rake splay, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, and look, there's no math. And she was sitting there in the back laughing, being like, this is all math. (laughs) (laughs) That's like her. (laughs) Most things are about perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we we got as far as we're going to get with Rex's toolkit right now. So the normals rulers, all that stuff. And now you got sticky notes, you got floss, you got a little Mm -hmm. protractor, a laser beam, an iPad. Oh yeah. And if you're lucky enough to touch it, some scuba diving weights are very useful too. What is going on? (laughs) So scuba diving weights are like, basically weighted hacky sacks. And so what you can do with soft outside, so you can place them on the legs of the chair so that it doesn't move while you're measuring it. Okay. This is weird. (laughs) I am very rarely speechless, but here we are. Here we find ourselves. This is what we're saying, Ben. Kelly and I in our shops are just like, how did this happen to us? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you Why are we broken? Cool lives. Yeah. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Calling all woodworking enthusiasts! Don't miss the Texas Woodworking Festival happening in Austin, Texas, on August 26th and 27th. This event is a unique blend of an industry trade show, tool sale, educational seminar, and a woodworking-themed festival. Meet and connect with fellow woodworkers, lumberyards, woodworking organizations, content creators, furniture makers, and tool manufacturers. Enjoy live music, delicious food, and cold beer while exploring the latest tools, trends, and techniques in woodworking. Get your tickets today at texaswoodworkingfestival.com and use the code SHOPTALKLIVE to get 10% off your purchase. Keep woodworking weird. This next question is from Peter. Um, I took a chair class almost exactly a year ago. We made a modern Windsor chair. I'm in the process of building more using techniques I learned during that class. I made the bending rig and followed the templates exactly. My arm bows are coming out well, but I noticed one thing. 
The chair I made a year ago seems to have relaxed its bend. The arms of the chair are about an inch wider than the fresh bends I made. The same when I, the same when I lay the template over the original chair. They're made from the same template. The chair is still beautiful and nothing looks wrong or out of place. It's just a wider bow now. Is this mm-hmm. common? Is it common for the arm bow crest rail of a Windsor chair that is steam bent to relax over time? If so, is there any way to guess how much the wood of the original <laughs> chair is kiln dried ash? I've made new bows from both kiln dried ash and green r- ribbon white oak. So this is, it sounds like, like a Cadillac problem from, from Peter. It's like, he's still got <laughs> yeah, a beautiful chair. Totally. So like, you're, it's you're such st- a trip to get these questions and be like, there's no way I'm going to know that. And you're like, Oh wait, no, 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 no. Yeah. 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 We got it. <laughs> <laughs> like what again like how did we end up here but um kelly you want to take that one i mean, I we mean can tag team yeah it. so i do find it interesting that I, I guess you need to build another one and see what happens over time and then like you can get involved in your own game of answering this question to see what really happens but um we do usually when we're bending wood we make the bend a little bit more extreme so that it relaxes out into where we ultimately want it to land. And that is probably just what happened is that the wood acclimated to its environment and is resting where it would like to rest. And that's that. And so moving forward, you know, you're sort of just taking notes on what you hope to get ultimately and what you need to get there i know that sounds really vague but like you need to get to know your environment like wood is wood and it's all like different and has grown differently and reacts responds differently to the processes that we ask it to go through with us um that's what i have i think that mostly like getting to know the material getting to know the environment and knowing that the bending form, having it a little bit more of an extreme of a bend than what you want it to be, generally speaking, is a good a good place to go with that. So, I say generally speaking because Aspen and I have had conversations where we're like, wait, that bend didn't move at all. What the f*** is happening? <laughs> yeah, I feel like I could get... Okay, Kelly, that is, I feel like Kelly painted the picture in the, I agree with everything you said. I think that if we were to get real nitty gritty, because isn't that what you want from us? Mm -hmm. Science? You You want want the full nerd? You want the full nerd, right? Okay. (laughs) So when I look closely at this question, I see that he said he made it in a class. Okay. And no shade on people who teach classes. I teach lots of classes. But if you're making a steam bend in a class, chances are you are rushing the drying process to uh, basically you're rushing it as far as it can possibly be rushed, right? So you're getting the bend, you're putting it in the kiln, you're letting it set inside the kiln on a drying form. But ideally, ideally, in not in a context that has nothing to do with classes and isn't like restricted to five days or eight days, you would wait a few days before you put it into the kiln so that it acclimates to, you know, standard air temp. And then you put it in the kiln because by rushing the drying process, you can, again, we don't know exactly what happened in this guy's bend. A lot of things could happen, but sometimes if you try to dry it too quickly and you don't put it in the kiln for long enough, or you put it in the kiln too quickly, what can happen is Essentially, it'll case harden. And so the outside of the material will dry, Mm. leaving the inside of the material wet, and it will capture the moisture inside the material, Mm -hmm. which means that over time, once it comes out, it may look dry, it may act dry, but then over time, you'll realize actually wasn't fully dry, and it will slowly relax as it acclimates. So So it's putting a sear on the steak. Yeah. yeah. And sealing it <laughs> totally. on stuff. What's yes. that? So like black and blue or something? Yeah. Nailed it. Huh. So honestly, in my experience so far, as I've like tweaked my classes, um, I more often experience the the bend shrinking when I remove the, the drying form from it. 
So I also say drawing form, I should say what I mean by that. So the bending form is the form that you use to actually create the bend right after the wood comes out of the steam box. However, most bending forms are complicated. They're large. They often have clamps on them. Those are not things that you're going to want to put into a kiln. And so usually what happens is you transfer the bent wood from the bending form into a much simpler drying form. And that's usually just something that holds the piece in that bend and then can go into the kiln with it. And so my experience taking things off of the drying form once they've been in the kiln for 72 hours is that they actually shrink up, like they get tighter, not mm. looser. And so I think as long as you really nail the temps, which, you know, between 125 and 140 degrees um, for 72 hours, you should be in a pretty good place. Ideally, you're going to give it some time outside of the kiln before you put it into the kiln, again, to let that moisture on the inside escape. Um, but, you know, yeah, as Kelly said, there's only a certain amount of control that we can exert. And like, it takes time to understand the material that you're using and the way all the way the way that every single step of the process can affect the outcome so i would say like if you get a result that isn't what you're looking for really think about everything that happened to that piece of wood from the minute that you selected the material you know because if you're choosing slow growth wood faster growing wood that's going to react to a bend differently mm -hmm. you can move the toggle on that you can move the toggle on how hot the kiln or how hot the steam box is and how long it's hot for. You can move the toggle on whether you overbend or underbend. You can move the toggle on how long it's outside of the kiln, how long it's in the kiln, the temp on the kiln. The other thing, I mean, it's just a little note that I don't, I assume Peter has already done this, but I've noticed that some people who make kilns to put their wood in, they don't remember to poke holes in the kiln. Yeah, the goal is like, oh, point. we just want right dude i'm just thinking about it being like maybe it's that simple right. you know like we took a really wide view but sometimes i notice that people because the goal of the kiln is for it to be hot right mm -hmm. but really the goal is for it to be hot and dry like we don't just we want it to be we don't want it to be a steam room we want it to be a sauna because yeah. the goal is to dry it out and so if you don't poke holes in your kiln and not just little holes I'm talking like drill one inch Forstner bit holes in your kiln, then there isn't space for that moisture to escape. And you may actually just be heating up your bend, not drying it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Creating a sauna. Yeah. A lot of variables. It's very relaxing for the wood, but it's yeah. not what, it, it's not what <laughs> you need. Yeah. Or like a steam room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. We are 50 minutes into this, which is great. I love <laughs> going deep. And Did you say 50 or 15? 50. 50, okay. <laughs> I don't want to let any more time go before we talk about Chairmaker's Toolbox. Yeah. Because this is a really important thing that, that you two are doing. So here we go. Tell us about your Maker's <laughs> Toolbox. I mean, I can give you the broad strokes. Kelly has been a critical player. Um, the broad strokes <laughs> are basically, it's like a, it's a three-part project, the goal of which is to make chair making and woodworking more accessible to everyone. Um, but a lot of our programming is directed towards historically excluded people. And so we have three parts of the project. One of them is education. So we do like free classes and we have educational partners all over the country and now expanding to the world. We're coming for you, Australia and England. <laughs> but um, where we teach free classes and part of what makes those really special is a lot of them are, are full affinity, full scholarship classes. So we're not just putting one person of color or one female identifying person or one gender fluid person into a, an otherwise um you know it's traditional woodworking class we're creating cohorts of people so they're leaving with skills and a community of other chair makers that they can communicate with and share ideas with and share shop space with and teach with and you know creating creating like a reverberating space for those folks in order to you know create a sustainable experience in woodworking and then i'll end with the toolbox project because that's going to kick right to kelly um, so we also do something called the Living Tools Project, and that is where we collect tools from retiring makers 
and we give them away to people who are emerging into the craft and who need them so that they can fuel another amazing, chaotic, Mm -hmm. (laughs) unpredictable life in the field. Um, And that project was inspired by like a very personal experience that I had of, you know, having a five-year plan to buy all the chair making tools I needed. And then um, Pete Galbert, who is my mentor in chair making, he got a call from a student who said he wanted to donate tools to someone who had used them. And I casually was like, of course, I'll take tools. And then two days later, I'm unpacking a box with every tool I need to make chairs. And it completely changed my life, you know? And in that moment, I was like, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cry a bunch. And then I'm going to call this guy and tell him that the least I can do is promise to never sell these tools, Mm -hmm. but to give them away when I'm done using them. And therefore, you know, basically amplify that original act of generosity. And so that's the one rule of the Living Tools Project is you donate tools and then the people who receive them will never sell them. They'll give them away. And so it creates this sort of connection between, that's why we call it Living Tools because it's otherwise, we've all been to some sad Craigslist yard sales, right? And I've made some good scores at those, but that's not where you want your tools to end up. You want your tools to end up in the hands of somebody who's going to appreciate them and use them and love them the way that you did. And so we've had some really amazing relationships um, form with the donors too, as they, you know, they can choose to stay in touch with the person who receives their tools. They can receive pictures of the projects that they're working on and just getting to speak with somebody else who really appreciates what they're getting and whose life it changes rather than someone who's going to try to bargain you down on the cost of your number four smoothing plane. I think is just, that is the thing. That's the experience at the end of a career that actually reflects the joy and intention that that maker put into their life in wood, you know? And so that's why I think that's why that project is so exciting to me. Uh, The third one is called the toolbox. And that basically comes from the idea that there's so many people who need and want chair making tools. And so few people who even know what they are, like let alone Mm -hmm. them. And so we had this idea of connecting um, people who are interested in producing a Windsor chair tool um, with someone who is an established chair maker who can give them feedback on that object. And essentially what Chairmaker's Toolbox does is we just facilitate that relationship so that the tool maker and their mentor trade prototypes. Sometimes they design together and they get to, you know, it takes been taking about a year, 18 months for someone to go from what's a travisher to here's my travisher and it's ready for market. Um, and then that person, that tool maker, has that tool as something that they can sell, they can use as a support for their business to keep their business solvent, um, can use it to like offset the cost of their sculptural practice, whatever it is that they want, but that tool is theirs. And so the chair making field, we get more tools made by incredible people. And we also get a much more diverse group of people engaging on a really high level with the field as the people who are producing the objects that make our chairs. Yeah, because there's so many tool makers with wait lists years long. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and the market yeah. needs so more tool makers right now. The market yeah. will bear more. So yeah. that's where Kelly came in. And I mean, Kelly immediately connected with the tenon cutter and all of its potential and all of its flaws and its traditional form and dove like head first into making an object that it's the Cadillac. It solves all the problems that you've ever had with mm-hmm. it, with the tenon cutter. And actually, you know, it, it's an absolute pleasure to use and it works perfectly. Um, I just used it to cut like 300 tenons at Anderson Ranch. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How long of a process was that development? Oh, God. It was like a year and a half. Okay. So it was, um, I honestly thought that it was going to take like a month. (laughs) I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you. (laughs) I know you are. I was there. I I don't think, yeah, like I don't (laughs) think that you realize that until you start trying to make something that doesn't exist already. Um, yeah, I was listening to this podcast, um, How I Built This, which is really fun to listen to. And it was about the person that made the uh, Leatherman. 
And he, I was like still deep in the process when I was listening to this. And he talks about how like he got permission, I think from like his wife or something to take off work for a few weeks while he developed it. And like it turned into like five years or something. (laughs) Okay, cool. (laughs) Not that I just like created the letters, but you know what I'm saying? Like I needed that from somebody else who had gone into this thinking that it would be like a few weeks, maybe a month. And then it, it took a long time. Yeah. It took a very long time. There was like two iterations of the tool also, um, where I got to completion with one and then Aspen and I were together at the first chairmakers toolbox class at Greg Pennington's place. And I realized that there was like an absolutely unforgivable flaw. And I almost (laughs) gave up at which point I called um, Pete Galbert, who was helping me with the tool and is also a friend and my mentor before this tool. And he like talked me down and was like, no, this is just like part of the process. So we'll scratch it. And then we started fresh. And then from there, honestly, like after that, it was like only a few months after that, I think like three months or something until I like had figured out production. Um, for what we had come up with as like solutions to the problems. I would, I would think that that would be the very hard part is now how do you produce them at a level? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it definitely. And like there were ups and downs, a freaking emotional roller coaster. You gotta be, you gotta be ready for that. I guess there were ups and downs with that as well. And points where I was like, there's, this is impossible. Like, uh, all of my original tenon cutters, I was, I was reaming by hand with Tim Manny's reamer, and these, this is like hard maple, like two and a half inches of it, and I was about to give up and be like, no, there's no freaking way I'm doing this. <laughs> so figuring out how to do that, like machining it and all of that is just one example of like the many things that came up in that process of figuring out production. Mm -hmm. Um, So, but I have it figured out now and I'm excited to move forward with it. And I'm sure that things will change now, but I have it set up well enough that I can do like small batches. Good. Cool. Yeah. So, so how do people, how do the listeners get involved in Chairmaker's Toolbox? Um, I'm sure there's, I'm sure money helps, right? Yeah, money helps. Money equals time, equals resources, equals more access. Yeah. So is Not there a wrong. website that people can go to to donate money and or reach out and talk about donating tools or what's... Yeah. Yeah. We have a www.thechairmakerstoolbox.com and you can contact us that way. There's like special buttons for donating money and every cent counts. I mean, we're one of those small orgs that, you know, we have like $7,000 in the bank, you know, (laughs) it's a, yeah. So we get a $20 donation and we're excited. So, Mm -hmm. um, and we also have $7,000 in the bank because we keep spending all of it on everything that we want to do, you know? So, I mean, making sure that people have access to these classes, that their materials are paid for, that they're able to get where they want to go. Um, yeah. I mean, taking time off in order to take a class is such an enormous privilege and really breaking down the barriers to do that. Um, you have to come at it from a lot of angles and the tools themselves, those are incredibly valued and loved when they are received. I mean, it's like Christmas morning every time we unwrap one of those boxes. So you have tools that have been gathering dust, or if you have tools that you just would love to see someone else using, yeah, we would love them. Please join us. Are there specific tools that, that you d- aren't getting enough of? And You know, I think every kind of like, obviously chair making tools are things that people are always looking for. Like we just put together um, a packet of chair making tools to go to this really cool organization um, called the Motor City Staked Tenon Society, which is a chair making group um, out of Detroit. I want to be there. <laughs> so they, they wanted, 
yeah, right. Where's their hat? Where's their patch? I yeah. want it. But yeah. Have, yeah. They're uh they're like they're a BIPOC only um chair making group and they wanted to add another member. And so they mm-hmm. needed another set of these essential chair making tools in order to bring another person into the group. So any like specific chair making tool is very useful. That being said, we have a collection right now of just, you know, your standard cabinet making, intro to cabinet making set that we put out called the Willowbrook collection. And we've received over 300 applications for that collection. And there's, you know, so there's 299 people who want it bad enough to fill out a relatively extensive application and they're not going to get this particular set. So, you know, even if you don't have a full set, if you have a hand plane you're not using, if you have some chisels you're not using, I mean, we can put those together and then form sets out of them and then give them to people who have a real, you know, real need and a real good chance of using them. And we should, we should probably be clear y'all don't have the time to be rehabbing the tools for the people. So you're not, you're not <laughs> looking for, for the, the rusty, right? I'd say nothing broken and yeah. ideally nothing rusty. That being said, one of the other things, and I might be jumping the gun a little bit on this, but one of the other things that we're really looking for, we'd like to send these tools out sharp and ready to use. Okay. Or so that the only thing that needs to happen to them is that they need to get sharpened, which means we need, rehab crews. Yeah. So if you enjoy sharpening, de-rusting, resetting these tools, then we're putting together little crews of people all over the country who are interested in having a little set of tools sent to them. They can work on them and send them back to us. And yeah. So, I mean, even if you have, as long as the tool isn't straight up broken, okay, I think that, or the casting isn't cracked, I think that there's definitely potential for us to use them. They just require a little more elbow grease. So if you like elbow grease, if you have extra <laughs> elbow grease, we'll I, take it. <laughs> next time I'm I'm up in New Hampshire, do not let me leave without a without a batch of tools to to awesome. out, cool. To you got it. I have one with your name on it. <laughs> Good. Well, both of you, thank you so much. And uh, Kelly, where can people find out about your tenon cutter? On my website, which is Studio Happis. Um, S. T-U-D-I-O-H-A-P-P-I-S dot com. There's um my work is on there and then also there's like a shop area and that has information, like deeper information about what it is and how it's used, photos of it, and a shop as well. And you can sign up um for a wait list on there. Cool. Well, awesome. I, I I think that's as much woodworking geekery as we can slam into one episode. <laughs> you want to bet? <laughs> <laughs> well, that does it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Don't forget to head on over to findwoodworking.com slash e-learning for more information on this cohort of Mike's Foundations of Woodworking class. Get in on a deep dive of joinery and furniture making and everything you need to know about it. Thanks again to Aspen and Kelly for joining me on this episode. If you have any questions, please send them into shoptalk at taunton.com. Leave a comment below in the show notes or on YouTube. It helps. It really does. While we're talking about helping, a five-star review on iTunes truly does help more people find the show. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening.